Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. I know it's been a kind of a heavy week for a lot of people. Um, I just want to remind you, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, not on the COVID situation, not on the pandemic, not on what's happening in Afghanistan, not on the government, but we fix our eyes on what is unseen. For what is seen, it's temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. There's a verse in Isaiah, it says, <clears throat> strengthen your weak arms, steady your feeble knees, say to those with anxious hearts, be strong in the Lord, do not fear, your God will come, he will come with a vengeance, he will come with the recompense of God, and then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will hear, it says the lame will leap like deer, it says the mute will shout for joy, and the Lord will cause there to be streams in the desert. Amen. So right now we rejoice in our suffering. For we know that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. I didn't make all that up. I just memorized it. I would encourage you guys, man, when you're tempted to look at what's going on around you, remember this, there's something bigger happening. There's something way bigger happening. And God is, it says God in heaven laughs. It's not, he's not laughing at our pain. He's laughing at those who think they can stop him. He's like, who do you think you are? Little people. I am God almighty. I rule over the nations of the earth. I set up kings. I tear them down. He is in charge. And don't you ever forget that. And so don't keep your eyes fixed on what you see. Keep your eyes fixed on what is unseen, which is hard. But you do that by staying focused on him. Amen. All right, let's close in prayer. No, I'm just kidding. That's my sermon. <laughs> hey, so I'm Joel. I'm the teaching pastor here. And we are in the final installment of our series we've been doing called Free Your Father, where we have been talking about the fact that Jesus came to set us free from the power of sin and death and how we've been set free. Um, we came from a lineage of fallen humans, from the time sin entered the world through Adam, it says through one man sin entered the world and it says through one man we were delivered from the power of sin through Jesus Christ. He came and he set us free and the challenge we have is to, first of all, recognize in our lives we're no longer slaves to sin, we're free. And a lot of times we've had an imprint from the people that came before us, our parents, our fathers, our mothers, they weren't the best because they had the same problem you and I do. They were, they were sinners. And so they passed things on to us. They left an imprint on us. Some of us is very painful. Some of us, we felt like we couldn't live up. We couldn't make it. And a lot of times what, what happens is we project the first God-like figures in our lives. We project our take on, from them onto God and we get a wrong picture of who God is. So part of, part of the Christian walk is learning new things, but a lot of the Christian walk is unlearning wrong things. And so as we're unlearning those things, we begin to walk and look more and more like our Father in heaven. As we reflect our Father in heaven, that's how we make a, become a light to the world. We looked uh, a few weeks ago, we looked at the verse that said, now you are Christ's ambassadors saying, hey, be reconciled to God. Like God is not mad at you anymore. Repent of your sins, come to him and you're forgiven. And that is the message we have. And that is the hope we have. And now our responsibility is to share that with those around us and also to walk in forgiveness of the fact that those who came behind, before us didn't get it right all the time. So that's what we've been talking about. If you haven't got those, we're, they're all, all four of those messages are um, on the app. So I would encourage you to download that. But this morning is a very special morning because uh, we've been talking about dads and I have actually brought my dad here. Yeah. Actually, the, the truth is he actually brought me here. But uh, so don't leave without me. All right? You're my ride home. But, uh, but we're going to talk this morning about, uh, about, about this challenge of I think there's something deep within all of us that knows that we have this responsibility to leave those who come behind us a little better off than what we had. And I've heard that drive a lot of people. I hear a lot of people say this, how do I give my kids a better life 
than the one I lived. And we feel that pressure. And maybe you don't have kids. Maybe you didn't have kids, but, but you've been investing in your nieces or nephews or Maybe you're investing in the students that you teach or, you know, we all sense, even if they're our kids or somebody else's kids, we feel like there's this responsibility that we need to leave the world better than we found it. And especially if you had a hard upbringing, you go, man, I'm going to make sure that my kids never have to go through what I went through, right? I hear men say that all the time. The reason they work 16 hour days is to make sure they can give the kids the finance, their kids can get the Air Jordans that they never could get. Or to make sure that they, you know, all the things they never got, they, they want to make sure that their kids get it. And so we all feel this pressure of, man, how do I make the world a better place for those coming after me? I talked about a few weeks ago, I was on a podcast and they popped a question on me from a listener. And the question was, how do I keep from becoming my father? And a lot of us, what our driving force is, is, man, how do I keep from becoming all those bad things my mother or father was? How do I keep from passing on this addiction to my kids? How do I keep from passing on poverty to my kids? I want to make them better off, but we constantly bump into these blockades. So we're going to talk today about how to pass the blessing on to the next generation. And I would, out, come on up, come on up here. This is my dad, Rick Malm. And um, I, you know, I've told you a lot of stories about him over the last few weeks. And I, I really believe that the reason I'm standing where I am today is because I'm standing on the shoulders of this giant right here. I'm taller than him, but he's a giant. Because he set a spiritual foundation. At some point, you know, we, we heard about his background. He, he didn't have the best background growing up, but at some point he said, I'm going to make sure that my kids have a better life than the one I did. You know, you mentioned already kind of the big danger with that question when we asked that, because typically what we think about is the areas of hurt that we experienced in our life. And so, like you said, it's, uh, well, I'm going to make sure they get an education that I couldn't get, or I'm going to make sure they, get, they don't have the money struggles that I had, or all those kind of problems. And man, when you're doing that, you're setting yourself up for failure, actually, when you, when you set those as your goals. Because there's a principle in the world that what we tend to focus on is what we tend to go toward. And so if you're talking about, well, you know, I want to make sure my kids don't have the money problems that I had, or they don't have this, your kids sense that. And all of a sudden, what becomes most important to them is, I got to get a good job. I got to get, I got to make lots of money. I got to get a good education or whatever this. And that's not really what you want <laughs> for them, <laughs> what you really want for them. Because if you'll, if you'll direct them toward the Lord, seek first the kingdom of God, then all that other stuff comes along. But if you're directing them toward, I got to get a good job. I got to get a good education. I got to get this. I, I want to make sure I don't get into those addictions. I want to make sure I have a stable family. The more you chase those kind of things, the more elusive they are, mm. the harder they are to grasp. And so really, I mean, this sounds like the thing you'd get in church, but it's, work, it's because it's true. Um, we, are just, <laughs> we are in yeah. church. We are in church. If you'll just point them toward the Lord, and, you know, frankly, I'm not as insightful, what would you say, intuitive, or I don't think too much about stuff. I just kind of live life at the surface level, not like this guy, okay? So all this stuff he's telling you, I didn't really think it through. I just knew that I wanted to live my life to please Jesus. So if you're real simple like me, I just want to tell you, it'll work. If you'll just live your life to please the Lord and seek to have live before the Lord, before your kids, it comes out okay. Mm. It works out all right. So I know some of you sitting here maybe kind of thinking, man, I just can't. I hadn't thought about that. I haven't thought about you know, I don't even know I ever thought this. Frankly, <laughs> I just knew I want to serve the Lord with all my heart. I want to stand before him one day and hear him say, well done. Mm. And that worked. And so it's for, and this is good for you insightful people. You think these things through. Does that blow everything? I hope no, not. That, that, yeah. <laughs> so we've, we've been looking at this verse. This whole series has been based on this weird verse in Hebrews 11, where in Hebrews 11, God, uh, uh, Paul, he lays out this list of people who lived by faith. And he says, all these guys lived by faith. And then at the end of the verse, it says this, chapter 11, it says, and all these people that I just talked about were commended for their faith, but none of them had received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And there's this weird sense in this verse that we have a responsibility to carry on this work of redemption that God has been doing in our family in the world. From the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, there's this thread of redeeming the world that God has been bringing around. And we have a part to play in that. And your parents didn't live up to all they could. 
You're probably not going to live up to all that you could, but you need to fight and strive to become all that God placed in you because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has perceived what God has in store for those who will put their hope and trust in, the, in Him. You can't even imagine. Dad used to always tell me this. He would say, God's plan for your life is bigger than your plan. It's what your plan would want, you would want your plan to be if you knew all the details but we don't know all the details. And sometimes we get limited by what we saw growing up. We think, oh, that's the best it'll ever get. But there's things that are far exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. Things you can't even imagine. Entire worlds exist for your family in the future that you can't even imagine. I mean, if you look at, right, at, at all three of his kids are serving the Lord, serving in church. Could you have imagined that growing up in Illinois for your family? Because the example you had was not anything super stellar. Yeah, um, no, <laughs> it was not, and, um, but that, that was, you know, the, the, it was, was the dream I had, you know, is I, I, I really believe that they're, the kids don't have to rebel, they don't have to run from the Lord, you know, don't let people tell you, well, that's just a part of growing up, well, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, I think a big key of it is the humility in that you keep the open channels with your kids so they don't feel like they have to run from you mm. to get free from you. You know, that if they feel like they can come and talk with you about the problems, uh, I, I think you guys have felt that way, that they could come and talk with us about the problems. Yeah, that's uh, true. Another deal is, too, really, you've got to, this verse about Hebrews where it's generational, if you're struggling with your kids right now, I just tell you this, keep a long-term perspective. It's so easy to get frustrated, get so frustrated with them when they're in their teen years or their young adult years, and you end up breaking that relationship and it makes it harder for them down the road when they fall flat on their face or when they get married and they're having struggles or when they have kids grandkids can change a lot of things if you haven't screwed it up so bad that it's hard for them to come back to you does mm -hmm. that make sense and so if you're struggling with your kids right now keep a long-term perspective you say, yeah but my kid's 40 yeah but you're not dead yet and he's not dead yet or she's not That's dead right. yet so keep a long-term right. perspective it might be when they hit their 60s and you're toddling around, you know, that you finally get that relationship right. If you haven't so fouled it up before that it makes it hard. It's hard enough for them to humble themselves before the Lord. But if they have to also humble themselves before dad or mom, that's even harder. Mm. So I just say, you know, keep that relationship open. Just keep love. Just do what God does for you. Just keep loving. Even when you fall flat on your face and screw up royally, just keep loving. And if you'll do that, leave the rest of it in his hands. He'll take care of that. That's good. So, so we've been looking at <clears throat> different relationships, father-son relationships, father-daughter relationships in the Bible. And there's one I want to bring up today. It's from, it's from the book of Genesis. And it's the story of Joseph. And if you look at Joseph, Joseph's life, if you don't know his story, he, if you, you think your family's bad, Joseph's family was horrible. His own brothers sold him into cross-border human trafficking. Slavery. He was sold into slavery. Then things got bad from where he started working faithfully for this master and he got ac falsely accused and got thrown in prison after that. Then in prison, he got forgotten about. But then overnight, you see that, God, that, that Joseph was taken literally from rags to riches and he became the most power, second most powerful man in Egypt. And ultimately, he became the tool through which he saved his entire family. Had he not had all those horrible things happen to him, he never would have wound up in Egypt, which is the place that his family ran to when there was a drought and a famine in, 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 back where his family was from. They came and through Joseph's leadership in that position, he was actually able to save his whole family and actually save his entire lineage for generations to come. They actually grew stronger in Egypt. And it was all because Joseph became a sacrifice for his family. He wouldn't have chosen to be that sacrifice. He got a bad rap. But as we look at Joseph, we see that his whole family moved down. He forgave his brothers for what they did. We talked about that. And at the end of his father's life, his father's name was Jacob, which God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And you know that all the 12 tribes of Israel, we've heard about all of them. But have you ever noticed that there's no tribe of Joseph? Joseph didn't get a tribe named after him. And we see why here in this weird verse in Genesis. It says, after this, Joseph was told, behold, your father, that's Jacob or Israel, is ill. So he took with him his two sons. Joseph had these two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. 
Then Israel, it's weird how it goes back and forth between Jacob and Israel. I think it's fascinating. Then Israel summoned, summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, that's a place in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me. And he said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and I will multiply you. And I will make of you a company of people and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. Now, Joseph, your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, they're going to be considered mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Sibion, those are the older brothers uh, who are actually part of selling Joseph into slavery, just as they were mine. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. So he basically says, your, your first oldest two sons, I'm taking them, I'm adopting them as mine. And there's actually going to be two tribes of Israel named after the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. And it says, they shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. And this is what stood out to me. Blessing in the future always requires sacrifice in the present. You know, in many ways, Joseph was a sacrifice for his kids. His life was a sacrifice for the blessing to be passed on to his kids. Now, Joseph got some blessing. Don't get that wrong. But if you look in the long generational thing, dad was talking about how God works in generations. We're so focused on our little world and God's working on a generational redemption plan to save humanity. And what's fascinating to me is that Joseph didn't get a tribe named after him. He had to sacrifice that. But his two sons, in, in many ways, he got two tribes out of it because it was passed down in his sons. And I think we need to keep, uh, you talk about the long-term perspective is so important. A lot of times we look and we say, man, my life didn't turn out like I wanted it to. This isn't what I, man, I'm, I'm, I'm 65 years old and this is not what it was supposed to look like. I was going to have more money in the bank. Things were going to be better with my family, with my kids. This is not what it was supposed to look like. But here's the thing. It ain't over yet. Because your inheritance may come through your children. And when God looks at you and he sees what you've invested in your children, the seeds that harvest that you may reap may not necessarily be on earth. But don't forget this. We're not living for earth anyway. We're living for eternity. And that's the really long-term perspective. That's um, that living for eternity. I think you, you, you do have to keep that in mind because... Again, many times you are sort of frustrated with where things are right now. And if you're planting seeds, though, in your kids, the, the, the best thing we can do is to give the next generation like a head start. You know, like if, if you're running a relay race, before the, the guy who's going to pass you the baton, you start running. So when he catches up to you, you're already in motion. And that's the best thing we can do is kind of give our kids a head start, you know. And I'm talking again about spiritually. The thing is, we always think about giving them a head start financially. I'm going to give them money. I'm going to give them this. And, you know, I've lived long enough to see so many f amazing families, families that I thought the parents were better than we were. I mean, we messed up a lot, you know. S amazing parents, and yet their kids end up running from the Lord. And I've seen a couple of things that they do many times is they, they don't, um, they, they buffer their kids from the, the struggle and the suffering, that comes and we because they want to give them a better life and so therefore I buffer them and you know it's in those struggles that we all gain our strength all of us do and that's why you're who you are because you went through those struggles mm -hmm. and if you keep them from those struggles then many times they don't it's the old story of the little boy and I'll end the story the little cocoon he sees a cocoon and he sees a little the, the butterfly trying to get out and the poor thing struggling so hard and so he decides he's gonna help he gets out his little knife and cuts it open and the butterfly then comes out but it dies because in that struggle, that butterfly gains the strength and it forces the blood out into those wings so that he has the strength to fly. And it's the struggle that caused him to be able to transform into that butterfly and be able to fly. And so when you say we save our kids from that kind of struggle, then they don't have that strength mm -hmm. that you have that was able to stand up and keep going and keep serving God in spite of all the difficulties. And they don't have it because they haven't gone through those struggles. And so many times we, we again, some of that is is allowing them to struggle a little bit. You know, it's like when they're learning to walk, you know they have to fall down. And, but you don't say, you idiot, what's wrong with you? You get them up and you encourage them. You try to keep them from hitting their head against the coffee table so they get really hurt, but you let them fall. Yeah. And so there is in that struggle, there's, there's the necessary for that struggle because you're looking for the long term. Which is encouraging, I think, if you've got a child right now that you're saying, oh man, here I am bailing them out again. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do yeah. is not bail them out. Yeah. Don't because, protect because them from the consequences. If they're really hard-headed, 
-hmm. Remember this, God loves your kid more than you do. Yeah. And maybe he's causing them to beat their head against the wall enough times to go, oh, and look up, right? I mean, you know how hard-headed you are and you pass that on to your kid, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding, not really. <laughs> and maybe that's what is being required. Maybe that's where the, the child is. But the, remember this, God's always working to get you back to him. That's his mission. So if you're right now looking at your kids and going, again, here we go again. The cycle begins again. Listen, no, if nothing changes, nothing changes. I'll say that again. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Maybe what needs to change is your interpretation of what love looks like in that situation. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. And many times the most loving thing you can do is not bail them out. Let them suffer the consequences because it's probably what brought you to the Lord, the consequences of your stupidity. You know, I mean, most of us, that's what brought us to the Lord. When we banged our heads enough, we finally said, I, I got to quit doing this, you know, and because and, nobody was bailing you out. Yeah. And many times by bailing them out, what you're really doing is protecting them from the hand of the Lord that is coming upon them in a heavy way. And so let it happen. Yeah. Let it happen. Oh, yeah. yeah so. so this story with Joseph gets really interesting because <laughs> watch what happens. So Joseph removed his two kids from his knees. You imagine having both his kids on his knees. He puts them on the ground and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. He gave reverence to his father. We talked about honoring your father and mother in week two. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger. Now the right hand is supposed to go on the older, okay? So he, he you know, he, he made a mistake here, right? He right, put it on the younger and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands for Manasseh was the firstborn. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. He took his father's hand and moved it over from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. He's like, Dad, I know you're a little kind of, you know, you're losing out a little bit as you're getting older. Let me help you get this right. And Joseph said to his father, not this way, father, since this one is a firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. And he said, nope, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. Now, step into a new season of who you can be. And dad, I think you've done this, you've done this gracefully because I've let a lot of, met a lot of men that get into their 60s and 70s and they still have to be the guy out front. I still want to be the one people look to and worshiped and, uh, you know, seen and for some, and, and you, you have been willing to, to, you have not done that. Any comments on that? Well, first of all, go back to the base. Nepotism is very biblical, by the way. Bringing your kids into the business, bringing your kids into the ministry. It's very biblical. I mean, David, you check out all of his, every, nearly everybody who worked with him was family. I mean, it's amazing how, how they were all related. So don't, don't let that, you know, bother you. But I think the other thing is, um, you know, there's an interesting passage. It says this, and uh, maybe it was God kind of trying to sidetrack this thing, knowing that there would be that tendency. Um, that a priest, he, he, a young man could be a priest at the age of 30. But at the age of 50, he could no longer do the ministry. It's amazing. It's, uh, it, 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 but here's what it says. It says at the age of 50, it didn't say retire, but he can no longer do the work, but he can assist. I thought, huh, now that's pretty interesting. So at the age of 50, it's like God said, no longer, you can't do it. Now, whatever age that may be, I, I, don't, I think that's more of a principle than really a hard, fast rule, you know. But there will come a time when it's time for you to step back. And he says, now you can still assist, but don't you be doing the work. So you be there. How do I assist? I'm there to cheer them on. I'm there to encourage them. I'm there to give counsel. They're probably not going to take it, but go ahead and give it anyway, you know. But give advice, share some things you've learned, and to push them forward so that that, again, God's a God of generations. And so he's concerned that there not be this boom, you work up until the day you die, and then the next generation has to start learning there. But there's that overlap to where it can continue. The, the influence, the force, the power, the, the ministry can continue greatly driven forward because there's a great overlap there. So I'm here to serve. I'm here to help. I'm here to encourage you and cheer you on. And it is kind of tough. It if, is you've been, if you've been the man in charge, you yeah. at some point have to go, I must decrease that those coming behind me may increase. Yeah. And because you realize they're not going to do it the way you did. But guess what? Probably the way you did it then isn't the way it should be done now. And that's hard for us to really buy into sometimes because, well, what worked for me ought to work for them. And so I think that's another, you know, one little boy said, he said, God, if you would, uh, 
if you would quit killing people, you wouldn't have to keep making all these new ones, you know? <laughs> and just keep the people around that we have, you know? And we kind of want that, you know? We kind of want things to stay the way they are, but the Lord is saying his kingdom is moving forward. And as the world is changing, there's different ways we're reaching people. And so he's taking the next generation. So instead of grumbling about that and being sad over that, just say, okay, wow, if I can push them forward. Here's the, because here's the thing, if I'm pushing him forward, says in, uh, Jesus said, uh, said this, he says, if, if you receive a righteous man because he's a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. If you receive a prophet because he's a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. And it's, and it's not like he takes that prophet's reward and breaks it up and you get a chunk and you get a chunk. I get the reward of a prophet if I'm, if I'm receiving a prophet because he's a prophet. So what I'm saying is when we push that next generation forward and encourage them, we get the entire benefit, the entire harvest. We get to share in the harvest of what they're doing in the spirit realm. And so it's by pushing him forward, it's not really like I'm stepping back. I'm getting greater blessing without all the work. <laughs> that's, that's, man, that's deep. Pretty good for a not very deep guy. Yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> didn't think that one through her. <laughs> that was good. We didn't talk about that in, the, in our practice session last night. So, so we're going to wrap it up here. And I just want to encourage you guys, listen, so much of the challenges we're facing in our nation right now I believe at the core have to do with daddy issues. There's a lot of angry and hurt people. And I don't know what happened to you growing up. And I'm sorry it did happen to you. I don't know how good or bad of an example your parents were, but but here's the thing above all else. The one you need to keep your eyes fixed on is Jesus. And we looked at this last week, Hebrews 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. There are so many people that have come before us. There are so many people around us that are in this struggle with us. It says, let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that clings to us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised its shame and is now seated at the right hand of God. He is up there cheering you on. He's saying, man, I know you got handed a bad lot in life. Maybe you're like Joseph. You feel like you're in the realm with Joseph. You got set back, man. You have addiction running in your family through generations. You're like, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to beat this. My grandfather, my grandfather, all of them were addicts. No, listen, it stops with you. You can be the one that says, nope, right here. And this is an example right here of what was passed on. My father, my dad's generation, he's the one. He was the Joseph in our family where he said, no more. It, they're stopping it here. And he changed the entire trajectory of the Malm last name. You can be that for your family. And it's not too late. You have kids right now, they're running from God. They're doing stupid stuff. And you're just like, oh my gosh, is this ever going to change? It can change. But here's the thing. You've already, it's, it's already been proven that it's not going to become from anything you can do. The best thing you can do is seek God's face and then let God's power work through you into the life of your children. Reflect your father. And as you reflect your father, let your light shine before men. They will see your good works. They will glorify your father in heaven. And that includes your own kids. Your primary witness is to them. You want to close? Yeah, just remember that he loves them more than you do. He, they're, they're just on loan to you. They're still his. Mm-hmm. God just loans us our kids. He expects us to give them back to him. And even if we've screwed up totally, he hasn't. And so he is still at work in their hearts. So don't, you know, don't doubt him. You, you may look and it may look impossible, but is there anything impossible to God? He said, I'm the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I created, I can recreate, I, he can work at deep levels. We just have to not make it harder. You know, just, just sometimes just step back so that he can do his deep work in their hearts. Let's pray. Yeah, let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.